What's going on, everybody? We're back. This is the final episode of Agitprop, short for Agitative Propaganda. Now, don't be worried if you like this, and I'm assuming you liked it, and that's why you're watching this live currently behind a paywall, and you're a member. Uh, reach out to your representatives and tell them we like the show and we want to continue it. But for the last episode of the trial run, uh, I have a very special guest with me. Her name is Natalie Wynn. Now, first, we're going to cover some uh, stuff without her electoralism and that sort of stuff. And then we're going to get really personal. Uh, Natalie is known uh, also as ContraPoints on the internet. Uh, she is a brilliant content creator, one of my favorite content creators of all time. She's a prominent member of the, uh, should I even say bread tube? I don't know. Originally, when I wanted, to even before I started the show. Originally what I wanted to do was bring on leftist content creators onto TYT's platform because I wanted you guys, the members, and also just the TYT audience in general to develop a better perspective, a different perspective on capitalism, to uh, understand that there were other prominent leftist voices out there that were growing and they were creating incredible content. So uh, that's why I had Dan uh, Three Arrows last week and that's why I have uh, Natalie on today. And I'm really excited about this show. So um, let me just quickly go through the topics. Uh, we're gonna talk about Joe Biden really quickly. We're gonna do like a quick Joe Biden's brain is melting uh, episode. And then after that, I'm gonna bring on Contra to talk about the difference between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and why I'm a sexist uh, person who hates people of color, i.e. Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be making jokes like that. I'm on thin ice. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna have a very up close and personal interview with Natalie about how she got her start and why we agree on almost every single thing. And you know, comedy in the neoliberal era. Is it dead or is it not dead? Because I do think that ContraPoints is, is a brilliant content creator and very funny. Okay, so without further ado, that is Agitprop. Let's get started. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to deliver some really terrifying news. The Democratic primary frontrunner, Joe Biden, his brain is not functioning, okay? It's not, I'm sorry. This is, this is a hard to swallow pill for some of you. Obviously, if you're members of TYT, you already know this, but his brain is simply not functioning. My man is sundowning. Let's take a look at his uh, latest gaffe. Because they invaded another country and annexed a significant portion of it called Crimea. Right. He's saying that it was President, my boss, it was his fault. <laughs> President, my boss, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Biden is, is very likely sundowning. I, this is speculation, obviously. And I normally don't like to engage in this sort of stuff. I didn't entertain it with Hillary Clinton when she was shaking or whatever. I'm not like a psycho uh, right winger. I don't think, uh, I, I don't like to entertain conspiracy theories. And Joe Biden is famous for a lot of gaffes, right? Uh, he's been famous for gaffes his entire career. Uh, he's also famous for uh, notoriously conservative and horrifically damaging bills like the crime control bill or the uh, attempts he's made to uh, work with segregationists or fondly recalling those experiences with segregationists. Joe Biden is bad, folks. He's bad. But also now his brain functions are no good, okay? I'm trying to put this as simple as possible. That's uh, there in that video that we just watched, he forgot Barack Obama's name and called him President My Boss. Uh, there's some more stuff, like for example, when he was slurring his way through his first speech as a candidate. And uh, this is way back when he was uh, more energized in his first presidential announcement. Let's take a look. I want to thank uh, uh, Rich Fitzgerald, the county executive, for Allegheny County Executive, for being here. And all my time in public life, from us, I've gotten involved. The country wasn't built by Wall Street bankers, CEOs, and hedge, and hedge fund managers. <laughs> okay, um, but you know what? It almost feels like the DNC thought, what is good about Donald Trump? I mean, this guy defeated us in the marketplace of ideas, he won. Uh, it's probably not the electoral college, it must be something different. There has to be something captivating about Donald Trump. It could not be his fake populism, i.e. his right wing populism. It must be the fact that his brain is also deteriorating. <laughs> or it might be the fact that uh, he is also an old uh, sundowning demented man. So let's, 
let's just put our version of that. That will be 30% less racist, and uh, that's a wrap. American people will be choose uh, will be forced to choose between these two boomers uh, that are from a different era and do not speak to the interests of the American working class. So unfortunately, that's that's what we have in front of us. Okay, and if you're still not convinced, if you're saying Hassan, these are like clips out of context. You're being crazy, like Joe Biden is fine. Here, let's take a look at a longer compilation. Union workers, the UAW took incredible cuts in their future. You don't have here in Miami, in Miami, in Florida. You don't have them here. And that is, if you keep an audience, all these breakthroughs we have with the whole, dealing with the whole, excuse me, help people who have or are in fact are and like to get Alzheimer's by Wall Street bankers, CEOs, and hedge, and hedge fund managers. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. Right. I found that. Julian, excuse me, the secretary, we sat together in many meetings. My wife is a full-time teacher, taught all, all during being, when we were vice president. But President Trump and the demagogues around, demagogues around the world, how can a person dignity be maintained? And she never yields. She does not break. She stands up. The bills that the president, that the, excuse me, the future president here, that, that, that the senator is talking about. We choose truth over facts. I keep my recommendation in private. Unlike you, I expect you would go ahead and say whatever was said privately with him. That's why I'll end the gag rule, the global gag rule that prevents money from getting to NGOs. $100 billion worth of, worth of loopholes in the law. Be so, uh, why, why they do that? I, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at it anyway. I, that's what I think my plan. I know what my plan does. So uh, that's a longer compilation created by Beto Dork. Uh, you guys can go check that out. It's like two minutes and thirty seconds long. Uh, there were some of uh, Biden's greatest hits throughout the campaign and also in the debates. Uh, some of which we didn't even get to. But it doesn't end there. Joe Biden is just con consistently flubbing all around the country, playing weekend at Bernie's basically by his campaign that are propping him up and also at the same time begging him not to say something totally controversial or not to look like a doddering old fool. Uh, I'm not being ageist, okay? This person should not lead the country, I'm sorry. I think it's incredibly cruel and inhumane that the Biden campaign and the DNC are propping this person up exclusively because he's doing well in the polls and that's the only thing necessary to apparently win. That's it, if you're doing well in the polls, then it should be fine. Well, Hillary Clinton was doing well in the polls and it turned out it wasn't really fine. And then we decided you know, we should have a, a wider, more male and, and also a more conservative version of Hillary Clinton with a longer track record that's even worse than Hillary Clinton to run instead against Donald Trump for some weird reason. And here, this is the last clip that I'm going to play. This is when Joe Biden was walking around and basking in the beauty of a, of a specific area that he was in. I've been here a number of times. Last time was, I think, all the way back in 2014. But I've been here before that. I love this place. I love, look, what's not to like about Vermont in terms of the beauty of it? And what a neat town. Yeah, that's not Vermont, Joe Biden. That's that's not Vermont. That's that's Keene, New Hampshire. And that's fine. I guess he didn't know. Probably because, like I said, they're playing weekend at Bernie's over there exclusively because I speculate that, and I'm talking about polls here, that uh they're worried that if Joe Biden drops out of the race uh, right now as the front runner, um, the the uh, the second choice for Biden voters is Bernie Sanders overwhelmingly. Well, not overwhelmingly, but the but um, that's the number one choice that they have as their second choice. So they're worried. I think the DNC is worried. I think they're trying to keep him alive as best as possible. And this is what our democracy has gotten to, which is great. But fear not, okay, because. Like really, what is the reason? Why is Joe Biden so palatable? Why is he he's so well liked, I guess? Or why is he doing so well in the polls? Well, of course, it's because of the Obama presidency, which he consistently brings up constantly. All of the good things under the Obama administration, I was responsible for all of the bad things that happened, like the three million deportations. Well, I had no say in that as the vice president. It's rather interesting that this is the perspective that he takes quite frequently, and the media doesn't necessarily seem to call him out on it, which 
I think is another reason why the media is also culpable here and they are also responsible. But you know, they would never do that. They would never prop up the DNC establishment candidate. They, <laughs> that would never happen, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Now, people have made very weak attempts on defending Joe Biden. We don't even get into his track record because his track record is horrific and I've done numerous videos on this already. You guys can go check them out and other people have as well. But one of Joe Biden's defenders was Jill Biden, his wife. So let's take a look at how she defended her husband. So yes, you know, I, you know, your candidate might be better on, I don't know, healthcare than Joe is. But you've got to look at who's going to win this election. And maybe you have to swallow a little bit and say, okay, I so personally like so and so better. But your bottom line has to be that you have to. Please settle for my husband. I did. You should too. Thank you for that. That was that is really brutal. It has to be just a brutal self own to hear your wife go on and be like, you just need to suck it up and vote for my husband. Like, why? There are what, like 25 alternatives that, that are younger than Joe Biden and will represent the same interests as Joe Biden. Why does it have to be Joe Biden? It's not like we're in the general right now and people are reluctant to vote for him. We are in the primary season, which is shocking. And then even beyond that, if we look at the polls, right? Like, why do we want Joe Biden? Well, we want Joe Biden because he is likely to defeat Donald Trump. Well, okay. Well, it turns out Trump trails top five 2020 Democrats in this national poll. The poll found that Biden, Sanders, Warren, and Harris, each topping 50% support in matchups against Trump, who does not poll higher than 40% in any of the head to head scenarios. Biden leads Trump by 16 points, while Sanders leads by 14 points, Warren leads by 12 points, and Harris leads by 11 points in hypothetical matchups with Trump. Now, polls at this point obviously aren't the most reliable things to look at, but she's saying like the only reason why you should vote for Joe Biden is because the polls say he's good. And you can watch the longer clip if you don't, you won't take my word for it. If the polls are saying he's good, well, here are the polls saying other people are also good. So maybe just once, just once American people should perhaps vote for who they want to vote for rather than who the media tells them is the most electable. Because this never ending cycle of the media telling you, oh well, Joe Biden is good and it's because he's the most electable and he's the most electable because the polls say he's the most electable. And then ending up in this like never ending cycle where people are like, "Oh, okay, well, I guess I'm conditioned into voting for whoever the media tells me is the most electable is led to Hillary Clinton and also Joe Biden. Uh, so. Uh, I'm I'm terrified. I'm I'm genuinely terrified of the future. I want to laugh at this. I want to be like, ha, huh, look at this sundowning boomer who's like trying to not have a heated gamer a uh, uh, heated gamer moment uh, live on camera in one of his uh, appearances. His own aides are saying it's it's getting more difficult for uh, Joe to uh, speak precisely as the sun goes down. Uh, do with that information what you will. Even Barack Obama at times back in 2016 told Joe Biden not to run and in 20 uh, and, and and this time around has also mentioned to Joe Biden that maybe it's not the best idea for you to run like what more do you want to hear okay this is insanity this is insanity i'm losing i'm losing faith in the electorate i'm losing faith in all of our institutions uh, and it, i feel like this is going to cause irreparable damage we have 100 million people that don't vote in this country Putting up someone like Joe Biden, who is a representative of all the old guard and all the things that are wrong with the Democratic Party is a slap to the face of not just Democrats, but Americans in general, okay? Oh man, oh, we're going to keep repeating the mistakes of our past, aren't we? And that past, unfortunately, isn't even like, like you don't even need to go super far into the past. Like, you know, four years, that's, that's as far back as you need to go. Anyway, um, without further ado, though, I think it's time to bring on our lovely guest, Natalie Wynn, aka ContraPoints, and move on to a different subject that is also controversial. Uh, what's going on, Natalie? Uh, I don't know if I promoted you uh, well enough. Uh, I said uh, you're an awesome content creator on a BreadTube. I don't know if that's like the distinction that we're still working with, or oh, is there- Oh, I think you did great. I. <laughs> I don't really call it, I don't like to call myself a bread tuber because I feel like that puts me as a representative of a community instead of someone who speaks for myself. But I suppose you could say that there is this forming community of new leftist creators on YouTube that seems to have taken inspiration anyway from me and from a few of my colleagues. So uh, I guess I can claim some responsibility for that. <laughs> 
Hell yeah, and and look, you do an incredible job. Uh, you're awesome. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna hype you up a little bit more in a second when we uh, talk about the, when we get to like the more interview style portion here. But before that, I'm going to exploit your labor as we talk about the difference between Elizabeth Warren Great. and Bernie Sanders. Are you ready? Are you excited for that? I'm super ready. Okay, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. A lot of people keep asking me, Hassan, why don't you like Elizabeth Warren? Well. I do like Elizabeth Warren, I think she's great. I think she has consistently been on the side of consumers and she has even spoken out against the Democratic Party at times when it wasn't even politically popular to do so. I do respect her, I don't care that she was a Republican all the way up until the age of 47. That requires a tremendous amount of introspection, that kind of attitude change is is genuinely a difficult feat. So. I respect her for that, I don't think that is a weakness for her as some people would like to claim. Now having said that, I still like Bernie Sanders. I like Bernie Sanders a lot more than I like Elizabeth Warren for some key differences. Um, first of all though, before we get into that, what do you think about that, Natalie? I, I know you don't really get into electoralism too much, but um, what, do you like Elizabeth Warren? Do you like Bernie Sanders? What's your take on this? I like both of them. Um, I think that those are my top two picks, Sanders and Warren. I do tend to avoid, especially this early, getting too viciously involved in the like democratic primary politics because I, I worry about the divisiveness that seems like it t tends to cost the left so much. Um, I mean, that said, I don't have no opinions. I, I I will be very upset if the Democratic Party forces me to vote for Joe Biden. Um, just the thought of having to vote for this man who's on video, you know, 20 times sniffing the hair of underage girls is just not my favorite thing. But I I like Bernie a lot. I like San, I like Warren a lot, and I'd be happy to vote for uh, either of them. Though I'm interested to hear what you say about Warren. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started on that then. Okay. So why do I like Bernie Sanders more than I like Elizabeth Warren? Well, the key difference here is Bernie Sanders understands what must be done. And what I'm talking about isn't necessarily like violently seizing the means of production with a vanguard party or something like that. What I'm talking about is even for modest social democratic reforms that are desperately needed in this country, Bernie Sanders understands that a tremendous amount of grassroots pressure applied at every step of the way is an absolute necessity. That's why he talks about our revolution. That's why he very famously had this to say. Let's take a look at this video really quickly. I'm not only gonna be commander in chief, I'm gonna be organizer in chief. I'm gonna run the presidency differently than anyone else. We're gonna go out to Kentucky. A very, very poor state where people are earning low wages, can't afford health care, can't afford insurance or pharmaceuticals. And we're going to rally the people there to tell their senators to stand with ordinary Americans and not with wealthy campaign contributors. People do want a government not controlled by wealthy campaign contributors, but a government that represents all of the people and an economy that works for them, not just the 1%. I think people are catching on so, that that is where we have to go. So this is a tremendous difference. Perhaps one of the most important differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and every other candidate. The, the fact that Bernie Sanders is, is not just talking about what it takes to win, right? And become the president, hopefully, but also what it will take, the, the struggle that will have to continue as we fight tooth and nail for even modest social democratic reforms that American people want, right? And this happened with Barack Obama. This is the reason why I think Elizabeth Warren uh, it hasn't really said anything that uh, inspires a lot of confidence in someone like myself uh, and, and uh, leads someone like myself into believing that she will continue the grassroots momentum and the public pressure that is, uh, that is an absolute necessity for Medicare for all. This is not to say that she is not a bulldog. This is not to say that Elizabeth Warren is not a fighter. But I do think that her uh, wonky attitude, right? Uh, it implies that uh, as long as we have good technocratic solutions, uh, to these modern day problems, as long as we write the best legislation possible, as long as we have a policy for everything, then yeah, uh, the Republican Party uh, is going to be forced to concede. And that's not going to happen. It didn't happen with Barack Obama, and it's not going to happen with Elizabeth Warren either, unless 
she openly changes her attitude towards this and and inspires confidence in the in the potential reality that she will uh, she will utilize our revolution. She will utilize different uh, advocacy groups to apply public pressure while also uh, channeling a, a progressive message from the bully pulpit. So that to me is a really significant uh, difference, especially when considering what Barack Obama did. Barack Obama had Obama for America. This was a, a, a incredibly successful grassroots uh, uh, group. Uh, that that Barack Obama uh, that helped Barack Obama become the president, right? And what did Barack Obama do as soon as he was president? He was like, "All right, that's it. We did it. Our job here is done." He shuttered uh, Obama for America. He changed the name to Organizing for America, and then he put Organizing for America under the DNC, and and the DNC essentially suffocated it. The uh, Organizing for America could have been pivotal, could have been the key to to pushing for. The uh, public option at the time, like this is that that was the purpose of it. That was the that was the intended purpose for uh, organizing for America. It was so that we could use Americans all around the country and and apply public pressure to enact these sorts of uh, legislative changes that Americans genuinely want to see and desperately need. And I'm worried that Elizabeth Warren could potentially repeat that. What do you have to say about that, Natalie? You agree with that? Well, I agree that Bernie Sanders, um, one thing I really like about him is that he seems rhetorically to be able to excite my generation in a way that I haven't seen a candidate do since Obama in 2008. Um, and I also think that he's not going to be, I agree that he's not going to be susceptible as Obama was to the need, to this, this feeling that he had to be to be moderate. So Obama got elected and then kind of you know, the Tea Party showed up, which is something similar will happen next time a Democrat is elected, and we all need to be ready for that. And I think trying to position yourself as a moderate or someone who's compromising with that is is just the way that nothing ever happens. And I do think that Bernie is has enough, you know, genuine uh, conviction behind his whole movement that I don't think I don't see him doing the same thing as Mama did. So I, I agree with you that I think that. This kind of looks like, to me, probably our best chance to really move policy further left than than we have been able to in decades. Yeah. Well, and and look, there is. You brought up a really good point, right? You when you said um, Bernie Sanders demonstrates moral conviction and also doesn't seem uh, to he, he he's not going to uh, wither away with public pressure and even change course, right? And I think that is a, a, a key difference between even Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And the reason why I mention this is because, unlike Bernie Sanders, the supporters of Elizabeth Warren are, are very diverse in the sense that Elizabeth Warren is now increasingly becoming more and more the, the reasonable alternative to Bernie Sanders by even centrist operations that are potentially allegedly funded by the Kochs, like Third Way. Uh, they uh, openly mentioned this a while ago. And recently there was a Jonathan Martin uh, piece in the New York Times talking about how Elizabeth Warren is interested in courting the, the same uh, influential uh, establishment Democrats in, in private phone calls. I'm just gonna briefly go over that really quickly. Publicly and even more in private, Warren is signaling to party leaders that far from wanting to stage a political revolution in the fashion of Mr. Sanders, she wants to revive the beleaguered Democratic National Committee and help recapture the Senate while retaining the House in 2020. She was one of the first Democratic candidates to sign a pledge circulated last month by Association of State Democratic Committees, vowing not to create any parallel political or organizing infrastructure that would compete with the national or state Democratic parties. The same pledge which was shared by a Democratic official also includes a promise to share all of my data collected during the presidential campaign with the DNC and state parties. Now, this is, you might be thinking like, why was this done? Well, this was done partly out of concern over Mr. Sanders, who has refused to share his 2016 supporter list with the party. But party leaders are just as concerned about the actions of former President Barack Obama. The Democratic National Committee wants to ensure that its nominee has no designs on creating a competing political entity in the mold of Mr. Obama's Organizing for America, which aimed to push his agenda as president. This is the reason why I gave all of the information information ahead of time about organizing for America and how that was seen as a competing organization because it put American interests first and not necessarily the interests of the Democratic Party. This 
to me is disgusting. Uh, Elizabeth Warren might be a key political uh, player here, and and the reason why she's giving concessions to the Democratic Party might be for political reasons. But this is what I mean when I say she hasn't inspired the confidence in me that she understands what must be done. I don't care about old grievances like, oh, you know, she uh, backed Hillary Clinton or whatever. That stuff is uh, is meaningless to me, at least. Uh, I don't care that she. Uh, was a Republican into, until you know well into her 40s uh, during the Reagan and, and the first Bush administration, which were obviously very racist and damaging to the country. I think uh, that that is not as significant to me as what she is going to do as president potentially if she wins. Um, and then also there is the key differences like her green military initiative and her more militant attitude in general versus Sanders consistently advocating against all of our imperial conquests. I'm obviously in support of that as well, especially considering that when you vote for the American president, you're essentially voting for the leader of the free world. I hate that cliche, but you know whether you like to admit it or not, uh, the vote that we the, the vote that we cast changes the dynamic of the entire planet. So. There is also that element there too. But um, yeah, having said all this, uh, have I changed your mind even a little bit? A little bit. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I agree with you. I, I do think I don't think I don't think I really substantially disagree, except that I am very pragmatic. I suppose how I approach these things, and I I don't know. I do so there's part of me that worries about the Democratic Party basically suppressing Bernie. Um, and if they do that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to vote for Warren. I'll vote for anyone. I'll vote for, I mean, almost anyone who's not Donald Trump. And, but I do think that I do agree with you that 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 the most left wing candidate is Bernie, and the one who's most likely to succeed at, um, you know, resisting the many many temptations that most mainstream politicians seem to have to acquiesce to his demands of you know corporate sponsors. You know the DNC, et cetera. Yeah, and and political pressures coming internally from the party, right. uh, and and that is definitely a messaging that we need to combat, that we need to fight against. And like you mentioned, I'm I'm fearful that uh, Elizabeth Warren is not necessarily going to do that. And and I don't know, maybe I'll, maybe these are unfounded fears. Uh, it's not because I don't care about Bernie Sanders' ideology or whatever. Okay, I don't care that he says he's a democratic socialist. Yeah, great. Okay, cool, fine, awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, and and I don't love that Elizabeth Warren says, "Oh, I'm a staunch capitalist," and I think like the reason why we need reforms is to protect the market. Like this is these are all insignificant differences as far as what their policies are in the short term, and that's what I care about is to at least marginally improve the material conditions of the American working class. And it's obvious to me that Warren and Sanders are. Uh, without, uh, with obviously notable exceptions in regards to foreign policy and whatnot, they're advocating for the similar kinds of domestic policy uh, proposals like Medicare for all and, and free college. So that's what's important, but the implementation is almost as important, if not even more important. And I don't, I think she falls short on that. Okay. That was the only part, I promise, Natalie, that was the only part where we were gonna talk about electoral politics and electoralism. Now, let's talk about something that you might be more interested in, you. So- Oh, well, the <laughs> most interesting topic. Yeah, of course. You and I, are, look, you and I are very similar in, in the fact that we're both filthy degenerates. And, and yeah, we love filth, basically, and hedonism and all of that. Uh, we have a very similar political opinion. Uh, we have a similar political perspectives, or at least I'm, I'm saying this because I've developed a parasocial relationship with you over the uh, over the past like two years that I've been watching your commentary. So I just I know everything about your life basically from all of the videos that you've put out there, and we've also hung out. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's one point at VidCon two years ago, which by the way was incredible that you uh, that like that two years ago at VidCon I saw you standing in a corner. And I was like incredibly excited. I jumped out of the car and, and probably freaked you out a little bit. And I run, ran over to you. I was like, oh my God, it's ContraPoints. This is incredible. With, with like my handlers running after me, like, what the hell is this guy doing? Um, and then now, only a year later, you were a featured creator and, and you've been all over the news. You're, you know, you just recently had a, a paper magazine interview too, I think, right? Yes. I mean, um, that's yeah. awesome. And also, it's well happened very fast. Thank what? you. It's happened very fast, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's true that VidCon 2018, I was uh, having to be snuck into events, and then 2019, uh, there were my events. So yeah, it's 
uh, it's it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's well deserved though. I mean, uh, Thank you're. You. I think you're you're doing an incredible job. You hear this all the time, so I'm not even gonna. Uh, I'm not even gonna get into this, but. You know what, let's talk about the, let's just get it out of the way, this is real quickly. Like, how did you get started? Um, like, what made you wanna do what you're doing? And and then we'll talk briefly about YouTube radicalization. Well, I got interested in politics on YouTube, basically because I saw, I was getting basically, I think the recommendations of the very early stages of, of what we now call the alt-right pipeline, that is this kind of, um, web of right wing and center right creators um, that it's now been pretty, you know, thoroughly covered in, in the media that a lot of basically young men tend to get sucked into this because they start watching, you know, edgy centrists, YouTube gamers, etc. And it starts out with jokes and memes and then the YouTube algorithm supplies you some more content about these things. Like, okay, so we joke about cringe SJWs. We joke about how, uh, you know, feminism is cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Milo Yiannopoulos, what a funny clown. Um, that was back in 2016. Well, I was watching the early stages of that, I think because earlier in my life, I had spent a lot of time watching um, this now dead and embarrassing thing we call YouTube atheism. <laughs> and yeah. I think that... A lot of the YouTube atheist, your YouTube skepticism, be the bigger t- t- community, kind of turned very, very right wing. In part because they did not keep up with the sort of social justice activist wing of that movement. So, um, you know, you had these creators who originally had been debunking creationists and so on, now obsessing over Anita Sarkeesian and making endless, you know, gamergate videos and videos about how. Actually, it's really important that all video games have sexy ladies in them. And like, th- this was a, you know, it's 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 funny. It's hard to explain to to most people. I think how that could lead to a far right nationalist politics, but it did. And I guess I got very interested in the early stages of that and decided to kind of make a channel that was sort of um, offering a counterbalance to that trend. And uh, it. Over time, you know, it started out slow. The first, the first, I've just been thinking about this lately as, you know, I I remember when, you know, it seemed like a lot of comments to get 300 comments on a video. The first few videos I got that I got a thousand comments were all brigaded by 4chan. And uh, it just became, you know, mostly just calling me a degenerate uh, homophobic slur. And Hmm. now, you know, to build this platform where I can, I get a, a million hits a video and it's, Many of them, apparently, from people who like me, uh, it's 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 wild that that that's, this has succeeded the way it has because it, it at first was very much a case of me as a very small minority voice in this world that I was you know my audience was as much more as much more right wing to begin with. Yeah, um, I think I found you through. H bomber guy, I uh, I, yes. I think that was how I found you and like the uh, the other content creators like Sean Jen yourself and also <laughs> Oliver Philosophy Tube and these are all people that I've worked with now I've I've been fortunate enough to work with at this point but um, I because I, I was shocked that there was this basically faceless uh, troll by the name of of Sargon of Akkad who is now <laughs> a famous political figure. <laughs> Who partially facilitated the downfall of UKIP? I guess. Uh, wow, how far we've yes. come. But this guy was just doing videos about me and the Young Turks over and over again. And I think we like cultivated this anti-TYT audience on on YouTube. Like we we that that were just very upset at us for apparently not getting frustrated enough with Islam <laughs> or or <laughs> advocating too much yeah. for women's rights or or. Uh, you know, criminal justice reform, which they were very frustrated with, and and they built these uh, entire communities around dunking on us, and like uh, and and that built a lot of like uh, just anti TYT sentiment on on the internet. Stephen Crowder is like one of the most notable examples of this, a guy who has essentially built a, a, a blossoming career out of uh, you know doing these sorts of like anti TYT sort of videos, and. And I just saw for the first time ever, like a very well produced video on Sargon of Akkad by this guy named H Bomber guy. I was like, what? People know who this guy is? People know who Sargon of Akkad is? That's crazy. I thought he was just like some faceless troll that 
that I'd, I'd never even like watched any of his videos, you know what I mean? Like I just knew that he existed out there and his fans would uh, brigade my stuff and, and get upset. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, there's like an entire community of people. And at the time I think he had like 30,000 subs or something, H Bomber guy did. And, and you were, I think you were around like 70 maybe or 100, I don't know, this was like a couple years back. And then you guys blew up and well deserved, uh, of course. And, and that was awesome. Because I, I do see a, a, the tide kind of turning. Because you can only make so many uh, Marvel franchise uh, movies want to uh, kill all men uh, videos until everyone's like, yeah, this is kind of outdated, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, we have a, 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 a proto fascist right wing government locking little immigrant children in, in detention centers uh, in, in essentially concentration camps. And you guys are still talking about like how uh, some titties are too small, have, have, have been. Uh, made right. uh, Star smaller. Wars, Star Wars has been cocked. That's the story. Yeah, I'm yeah, with. yeah. Well, by the most influential philosopher of our time, Stefan Molny meme, of course, uh, who calls himself the best philosopher. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about that really quickly. So, what do you think about the obsession of of like pseudo philosophy from the internet crowd and and like almost a total misinterpretation of history? Uh, that they're spoon fed by these people who fancy themselves to be the modern era Socrates. Yeah, well, it's there's kind of like a couple of different aesthetics that right wing YouTube people like. One is the edge lord, which is just, oh, the, the memeing, the joking, the offensive jokes. But there's another one that's less discussed that you just hit on, which is the very gravely serious rational philosopher. And I do think that this kind of attitude, this posture, this performance, it this is the one I think that's really connected to like new atheism and this, um, you know, it's very attractive to men, right? The, this idea of, you know, following this this Socrates figure, not really a Socrates figure because it's not so much around questioning, but more of a like, you know, almost a messianic figure who. Uh, is you know that this pose being very very rational, very very smart. That works seems to work for Ben Shapiro. It seems to work for Stefan Molyneux. It seems to you know these people aren't funny. These people aren't edgy. These people are very boring. But they you know pose that their their pose is like oh you know we are the rational ones. And so yeah. that for some for some reason this commands a great deal of respect among this crowd of young men. Well, I think you briefly touched on this in your very famous Jordan Peterson video as well. I think like they're just looking for a daddy. Like yeah, I think well, a lot who, of these. Who isn't, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, for some reason, they rarely ever see me as a uh, father figure, probably because I don't take myself too seriously, with the exception of the show where that looks kind of serious, but obviously I'm not a very serious person. Um, they don't see you as a daddy? Well, no. Uh, some people see me as a daddy, yes. But uh, the the. The uh, right wing stem lords and edge lords who fancy themselves to be uh, arbiters of irration, uh, rational thought and logic and reasoning look at me and go, oh man, this guy's beta as hell. He's a super soy and also not like, a, he does not command respect in the same way that Ben Shapiro does. And I think it's just like, it, part of it is because it, it is devoid of emotion, uh, potentially. That like they kind of like suck the emotion out of it. They kind of suck the theatrics out of it, and it's just like I'm going to talk very fast about like uh, seven uh, cherry pick data points that I found that correspond to my narrative that you know black people are culturally inferior. I'm going to substitute the word culture <laughs> with race because we know that racially uh, like, you know racially inferior is uh, is unacceptable. But uh, wow, oh we are, have a Ben Shapiro uh, B roll. I didn't even know that Look that was go. good job, guys. You guys are killing it in the in the studio there. Um, but yeah. You know, that's that's usually the uh, the the Ben Shapiro attitude. I don't understand how they can have this interpretation because, like, you standing next to Ben Shapiro, I mean, it's like an incel and virgin. It's like a Chad and virgin. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think maybe it's because they see themselves in Ben Shapiro. Like, look, it's a lot of uh, a lot of people are like pasty, sheltered uh, kids on the internet. So they just they look at someone like Ben Shapiro and they're like, oh, well, he's dominating. Like. He, so there's like two levels to this. Mm. One, he's dominating my enemies. He's destroying them, and I want yeah. that because I I hate like I hate that women have uh, belittled me my entire life, and you know popular people have destroyed my confidence, and it's all their fault. And it, now he's like now it's like a return of the nerds. Like he's fighting back. This nerd is fighting back for all of us nerds, and then. 
Um, so there's like this bloodlust almost for for this sort of conquest. And and he justifies like potentially by like these these biases that they may they may have that uh, liberal media keeps telling them is wrong. And then there's also another element where liberal media is sometimes wrong in the sense that yeah. uh, their their interpretation of of like um, socioeconomic inequalities or racial inequalities fall short of what needs to be done, which is material redistribution or or like at the very least wealth redistribution. Um, you see this with criticisms against Bernie Sanders. Not to be too much of a burn dog fanboy here, but they say it all the time. They're like, "Oh, Bernie Sanders doesn't address uh, like black people enough. He doesn't pander to black people enough." Like this is liberal media criticisms of Bernie Sanders. He must be racist. It's like, no, he constantly says, "Like, what do you think the increasing uh, the minimum wage is going to do?" Uh, if you advocate for criminal justice reform, everyone understands you're talking about uh, black and brown communities. But for some reason, when you talk about the minimum wage uh, or when you talk about economic problems uh, it, it, that also disproportionately target uh, communities of color, all of a sudden we're thinking like, oh, well, that's just for the default position. That's not for um, you know uh, marginalized communities that need to be protected, and they do need to be protected. But you know, you need economic solutions for those problems. Um, yeah. Well, I do think that you know the Ben Shapiro's of the world, they 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 really kind of um, build their sort of you know persuasive system on this, this foundation of attacking like PC culture, political correctness, which often it means attacks on id poll, right? It's like it seems like the most energy they get is not in fact opposing minimum wage, but opposing say Black Lives Matter, opposing you know. Trans people showing up in public, opposing that sort of thing. You know, they. It's. It, it seems to be. I mean, I. You know, it's sort of. It paints a kind of grim picture of the national psyche. But if that was, is what's effective, but it seems to be. I mean, a lot of what it seems to be was Trump's appeal. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Donald Trump did do that. He did that very successfully. Yeah. He, he cultivated this image that he was anti-politically correct, even though. I mean, it's it's fairly obvious. Well, actually, maybe not with Trump. Trump is literally just the least politically correct person on the planet. But um, but there are obviously sacred cows for Republicans as well. Uh, one of, of which I was uh, uh, one of which I was uh, reminded of recently this past week. But uh, the military being one of them, uh, of course, and uh, and and other things like uh, Christianity being under attack or uh, whiteness being under attack, and like anyone who will tell you, anyone who will create this victimhood narrative. Uh, for yeah. uh, white people, as though they are being persecuted at the systemic level, uh, is is going to be celebrated by the right, which is kind of remarkable because I thought it was like bootstraps mentality and bootstraps culture. But one thing I wanted to point out really quickly, and this is a new uh, this is a new uh, a study that came out, a new poll that just came out recently, that I that was shocking to me, even though it kind of corresponds to what I believe in, which was a, a Q poll that showed Republicans, out of Republicans. 45% of Republicans say anti-black prejudice is a serious problem. Only 45, right? Uh, that think like anti-black prejudice is a serious problem. 56% of Republicans say anti-white prejudice is a serious problem. So more yeah. Republicans think anti-white prejudice is a serious problem than Republicans who think anti-black prejudice is a serious problem. Well, I do think, and I've said this recently, that I think there is some truth to the idea that we live in a victimhood culture in the sense that like, there's this kind of prestige to victimhood or, or basically, I think even the far right has taken from IDPOL or even the centrists have taken from IDPOL this a certain way of presenting an issue as being the sort of um, besieged uh, identity group has to, you know, stand up for itself, and this is kind of abused by by all kinds of people. I mean, a straight pride parades, men's rights activists, um, you know, uh, right? Fifty six percent of Republicans think white people are discriminated against. Like, uh, you know, it's it's like they're trying to imitate the style of politics of, say, black civil rights groups or you know, gay liberation, um, but they want to do it for the you know the dominant, the mainstream group. Uh, I think there's some kind of prestige, maybe they think about being a victim, and they're trying to, to, yeah, capture. Well, some it's of that. it's hard to fight against it without coming across as like a villain, basically. And I think they saw that, right. so now they're trying to adopt it. And I they think partially it. they genuinely yeah. believe it. I, I think that they there are a lot of white people who genuinely believe that white people are under attack because if you're accustomed to a lifetime of privilege, then equality does feel like oppression. 
uh, and not being able to say, always, yeah, yeah, not that's being able to say the N word is is an oppre- is oppression. It's oppression. It's oppression. Well, and it's just like I mean, in the aftermath of the Civil War and Reconstruction, like if you look at the or like the early like like um, uh, birth of a nation or like early like clan propaganda, a lot of it was based on this idea that like white Southerners had been completely devastated by the Civil War, and now like you know, you know. Uh, the state legislatures were full of black people and like the, the poor white people had been left out or I mean look at the early propaganda of the Third Reich which was all about the poor disenfranchised Aryans and you know how they're you know they're being victimized by Jews like it's this is this is usually how it works where you you set yourself up as the victims and that's how you justify yeah the big, you know the 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 attacks on the minority group is by suggesting that the majority group are the real victims yeah by the way, Perfect point because I was just looking into this because there is like controversy stemming in some circles in, in bread tube and whatever on the internet mm. about uh, about like racism and and uh, and how it's been weaponized under capitalism and I think that's a good segue into what I want to ask you uh, about in regards to your uh, statements on on. Uh, champagne socialism or luxury communism or whatever uh-huh. you want to call it cuz i'm a, i'm in a similar boat with you and i i, I want to like kind of use this as an opportunity to describe to the audience what my perspective is but before that i just want to hear your opinion on this well i think that on the left there's sometimes kind of an aesthetic preference for uh, a kind of like spartan or or toned down existence right which is or sort of um monastic almost because yeah. you know Luxury is associated with the bourgeoisie or associated with the upper class, and so it's thought to be sort of corrupt um, or sort of decadent or sort of, um, you know, it's, it's a symbol, I suppose, of inequality. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that th- that doesn't really play to a wide audience, in my opinion, because I think most people, you know, it's not only rich people who like opulence, <laughs> who like <laughs> the idea of living a rich life, right? Which is why that, you know, even in very poor communities, like people seek after luxury goods, you know, of the kind they're able to access. And I think that, I think that it's it's not, I don't think it's good, for, it's a, I don't think it's a good vision of a human society to eliminate all like luxury goods, for example. I don't think it's, I think that those things actually do matter to most people. And I don't think that um, kind of saying like, oh, you know, this is, this is just wasteful. Like obviously, a lot of it is incredibly wasteful. And in my videos about capitalism, I've kind of shown the way that, you know, having people with way too much money leads to a kind of use of luxury goods that just makes no sense. That doesn't really seem to actually be helping anyone. And my case study is like golden pizza. You can go to Manhattan and buy a $2,000 pizza covered in, um, you know, flakes of 20 karat gold, 24 karat gold. Well, who cares? Like, this is not really, like, this is not champagne. Who's really enjoying the gold pizza? This is just, it's pointless waste. Um, but that said, I think that you know, th- there's some kind of ha- happy middle ground, which I think champagne socialism is a perfectly suitable title for. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I also feel like uh, people get a little too caught up in in like praxis or, or not praxis, but like maybe they get a little too caught up in theory in, yeah. in like a, a literal interpretation of Marxist orthodoxy or or um, whatever they fantasize about the October Revolution or or whatever in their mindset like whatever like point of time when when communism was successful yeah. uh, without you know uh, considering the many downfalls of of that sort of like vanguardist uh, accelerationist interpretation and and um, and refuse to admit that there are flaws in that. And and that to me always feels like being a Marxist for the sake of Marxism or for a sense of justice. And justice is important, uh, and and um, obviously. But like, I want uh, some. I want to. I want to redesign society, not because I think it will be just. Obviously, that's important. But also because I think it will maximize everyone's happiness. Like it sounds really yes. silly when I say it like this, but I think that's really important. Like, l- like liberty, true liberty that comes from uh, a, a greater redistribution of of profits or a, or a better redistribution of of our output in general will 
lead to a more fulfilling existence for everyone and and will lead to a more dignified existence for everyone and that's that's why I care about it I don't I don't care if it's like going to be implemented I don't care about the vehicle the theoretical vehicle that will deliver us a better future and I don't care if it's called like marxism or socialism or whatever uh, but the aesthetic is absolutely appealing, and obviously you can see that. I, I use the symbolism uh, as well uh -huh. to attract like younger uh, men, especially who are prone to uh, radicalization. And I think there is an importance for agitative propaganda, obviously. But but like ultimately, I'm not I'm not like in love with the the dogma of Marxism as as I uh, am obviously not in love with the dogma of capitalism. I that's the whole, the whole point of. of the show is to shed you of that dogma and, and offer a different perspective and maybe even uh, instill some different fundamentals in you in the way that, um, I don't know, commodities are produced so that you can uh, develop a better understanding of why there are so many material inequalities in our existence. So yeah, I just, I get very frustrated sometimes with the left, but having said that, what are your, what are your opinions on, on uh, how the left is divided then all the time? Um, I think that people who are attracted to left-wing politics, on average, tend to have a very strong sense of moral conviction. And I think that that's often not the case of people who are in centrist or right-wing politics. And I think that that means that you know a lot of people come to leftist politics for different reasons, right? This is a big coalition that we have that includes a more diverse group of people than any other political, you know, um, broad group. And so I think you have this problem where, you know, people, a lot of other people are very passionately focused on one issue, you know. So for some people that's going to be, they're against sexism. For some people that's going to be, they're, they're, they're really, they only are here because they care about economic equality. For some people it's because they have experience with racism, with transphobia. And we put all those people together, um, you know, there's gonna be some people really care about one thing that just doesn't matter to another person, and not everyone's educated on everyone else's issues. And what you end up having is, uh, you know, the basically conditions for a lot of infighting. But also, you know, you have a kind of high barrier to entry, as you know, you have to learn about a lot of different sets of issues to really function in leftist spaces and to be, uh, you know, to follow, you have to follow the rules of like, say, like a leftist Facebook group. You know, you have to know enough about transphobia not to be transphobic. You don't have to know enough about racism not to be racist. You have to know enough about, um, you know, feminism not to say things that are sexist. And like, obviously, everyone within those groups disagrees about what those things are. But, uh, you know, it requires people to be I'm very sort of educated about a lot of different issues, which I don't think is a bad in itself, because ideally we do want everyone to be educated about all those issues. Um, but you know, we have by by be, by being having strong moral conviction, we have you know that's 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 too bad. It's kind of difficult to have strong moral conviction and to succeed in politics, right? Like, wouldn't it be great if we only cared about winning? That would make things so much easier. But uh, unfortunately, we don't. Well, and not unfortunately, because I think that's you know those of us who are on the left. We're here because we we're not nihilists, right? We do have some kind of moral and political convictions, yeah. Um, and that, but you know, there's the same thing that makes the same thing that makes us attractive also sort of makes things difficult. Yeah, I think there's a personal line that people need to draw uh, between uh, dogmatism versus pragmatism, I guess, uh, for lack of uh -huh. a better uh, way to describe this this uh, dynamic, but. I always try to. Uh, I always try to to because I, I, I run into these problems in my Discord community and my Twitch community because there's a lot of like onlookers and people who come in and they're like fascinated by the the symbolism yeah. or whatever and they're like, what's going on with this guy? What's he talking about? You know, and and then. I don't know, there's of course going to be uh, transphobia because it's prevalent and it's mainstream. Like transphobia yeah. is a mainstream thing. It's uh, I think uh, Zainab on, on Twitter once uh, has said this before where it's like, there are like two groups of people that you can openly talk about as though they are not human beings and that's uh, trans people and Palestinians. In American yeah. mainstream media, it's like, yeah, no, we let's discuss what to do with trans people is like a, 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 a subject that obviously I find to be abhorrent but I also understand that that like uh, because of that, because of the uh, the um, mainstream uh, discourse on these sorts of issues, like a lot of people 
uh, intrinsically or immediately uh, don't come into the subject uh, with a lot of compassion. And their first uh, uh, response is to reflexively say something transphobic. We sometimes on purpose and other times not even on purpose when they're asking a question or when they don't even realize like yeah. how bad this might be. And they might be good allies down the line. They might become uh, advocates for trans rights. And I, I feel like this is a giant problem that I always uh, feel uh, that I have to, to work on when on the one hand, I don't want to show, uh, I don't want to excuse bigotry. But also on the other hand, I want to make sure that uh, you know, a little bit of bigotry is not permissible, but a little bit of bigotry is expected. Um, that's the way I see it, especially in regards yeah. to, like it, it, there is different levels obviously, like our culture has changed. Like if someone is openly calling black people the n-word, then like everyone knows like, no, you can't do that, you're, you're done, you're out of here. But yeah. um, but Ben Shapiro can uh, gain mainstream success by by uh, spreading transphobic uh, messages. And yeah, and transphobia certainly is expected, and that's you know I, I've made a lot of I'm kind of moving away from talking about trans issues so much because I, I sort of said my piece, but uh, for now anyway. But the, a lot of the, the material that I've made that are about trans issues are directed at people who are, I'm assuming, starting out from a pretty transphobic position because that's that's most people. Um, I'm, you know, and I'm not happy about the fact that it's most people, but that's the that's the reality. That's the situation. And, you know, this is this has been a source of a lot of tension between me and, and part of my audience because some people don't want me to be sort of um, they want me to move on to a higher level where people where I'm talking to people who sort of assume that we're human beings and accept the legitimacy of what we say about ourselves. Well, but unfortunately, most people don't. And so I feel that with the way I try to talk about these issues in a video, you know, a video essay for me, that's like a big platform. It's a big megaphone. It's a chance to talk to a lot of people about this very, very misunderstood subject. And my way of approaching it is to speak to people who I assume have a very ignorant um, position about it going in. So I made this video, for example, called Are Traps Gay? Which is, you know, a transphobic meme about the sexuality of men who are attracted to trans women. But it's a very popular meme. And it's, I think, for a lot of men in particular, kind of the starting point of their whole, you know, their thinking about trans women and trans people more broadly. So I kind of try to, you know, to meet them where they are and then to sort of hold their hand and try to take them at least up a few steps in terms of their understanding. Um, yeah, no, this actually gets to our final subject that I wanted to discuss with you, which is um, political correctness and comedy and, and comedy's useful as a, as a vehicle or as a tool to, to educate people, especially on on the the plight or the experience of marginalized communities that don't necessarily get a lot of mainstream attention, um, and you obviously uh, have done a remarkable job in, as you mentioned, educating people on trans identity and trans issues, um, and and have done a, a an incredible job in like bringing people uh, closer to uh, understanding trans people and and uh, and advocate even advocating for uh, trans rights and trans causes. Um, now, I asked you about this because I, before we even got on, I, I said, did you watch the latest uh, Dave Chappelle uh, mm -hmm. uh, like stand-up comedy? And you said, no, I, I'm assuming you have not watched it since we talked. I've, I've not watched it, I've seen the excerpts that are about trans people. I haven't watched the whole special. Yeah, and, and I thought, look, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I, Dave Chappelle and, and uh, Aaron McGruber were, Incredibly influential in my development and my understanding of, of um, like black culture in America because I didn't grow up in America. I grew up in Turkey, so that was my only insight into the uh, the the disenfranchisement or marginalization of, of African Americans. And it's a it's not the greatest uh, educator, but for me it was it was profoundly influential uh, in the sense that I learned a lot of. Like I developed a lot of my perspective by by using that as a launching pad, like using that as a platform to to dive deeper into these sorts of issues. So I think that comedy is is profoundly important in that sense, especially when um, when educating people about uh, the, the marginalized identities and the and the struggles they go through. But 
having said that, it obviously can, uh, the person who's communicating this message can, uh, after a significant amount of capital or after a significant amount of time has passed, can be a little out of touch. Um, well, I, I, think, I, I, yeah. I agree with you about Dave Chappelle. I mean, I think that he's probably a comedic genius. Yeah. And I, you know, in the early 2000s or late, you know, I loved his comedy. I loved his show. I think that some of his, what is it? I think there's one of his old specials, like Killing Us Kill Softly. Me softly. Killing, killing Me Softly, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest, um, you know, stand up sets of all time. But I think that Dave Chappelle talking about trans people is not Dave Chappelle at his finest. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, he's kind of stuck at this very basic level that he can't get past. And, it's, and you know, he could just not do the trans jokes because he obviously hasn't doesn't really have anything very incisive to say about it. And so it's it's actually I'm just sort of embarrassed for him watching him rehash the same old like yeah. identify as Asian like like oh Ricky Gervais on t stage in 2015 yes. just did I identify as a chimp like. How many comics, how many hack comedians have already gotten up on stage to do the I identify as something wacky joke about trans people? Like everyone's doing that. They've been doing it for years. And so, you know, I think if this were any other joke, if it was not transphobic, we would accuse, you know, accuse the comedians doing it now of stealing it because it's not a new yeah. joke. Um, but for some reason, people just have infinite patience for doing the exact same transphobic joke again and again and again. And so part of me suspects that this is not, I don't, does anyone really find that joke hilarious anymore? It's almost more of this kind of stubbornness, it seems to me. Like they resent having been told not to make the joke. And so they're going to keep making it out of spite. But is that really funny? It's not, I don't think it's very funny. I think it's very tiresome. I think it's overplayed. I think it's unoriginal. And it kind of you hate to see it from someone as fine a comedian as Dave Chappelle. Yeah, no, you're you're you nailed it. Like I mean, you talked about it in the darkness in the video that you made mm. uh, about comedy in general and like political correctness, which I highly suggest you guys uh, check out. It's great. Um, but like there is there is uh, dark humor to uh, be. Uh, there is obviously something funny about trans existence as well as every mm. other form of existence. Like. You can find humor in everything, even in the the uh, darkest corners of of uh, I don't know of of any form of of marginalized identity. But there is a difference between like a, a really racist uh, black person joke, for example, and like a very funny uh, joke that could be misconstrued and potentially is like bordering on the edge. That comes from a place of understanding the experience. And and you're right. I, I that's how I felt when watching uh, Dave Chappelle do the like. Oh yeah, like oh, I identify as a woman. Well, what if I identify as a as a Chinese uh, person? Like it's just, it's yeah. so played out. It's like the attack helicopter meme over and over again. And it's like if your comedy is is basically plagiarized from 4chan message boards, then that kind of sucks, dude. You got to get better. <laughs> yeah, and that well, comes I mean, from understanding. And Dave Chappelle he keeps saying, like, as if as if it's this thing that he was insistent that we acknowledge. He's like, you have to admit that you know trans people, the predicament they're in is hilarious. Well, I agree, it is hilarious. But you know, the the funny, you know, I'm a woman who used to be a man. Everything about that is hilarious. But I feel like there's a lot more to that than just like. Oh, I identify as something weird. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, that's not that's not really the funny thing about being trans. The funny thing is, you know, I talk about in my video, The Darkness. There's a video where um, the trans YouTuber Gigi Gorgeous, um, who's this like you know femme, beautiful trans woman, talks about like her, how she had to go to a sperm bank for for you know for she was trying she's trying to um, you know have a baby, and being a woman in a sperm bank that's hilarious. That you know that's that's worth. 10 minutes on stage as, as a comic, but that's not what Dave Chappelle's doing because he doesn't know about that. He doesn't know yeah. anything. All he knows is a meme from 2012. And it's just it's just kind of disappointing as someone who enjoys comedy just to see that that's the best we can come up with. Yeah, in the sense I feel like on the one hand, I, I feel like political correctness does have a capacity to ruin a comedy, hmm. sure. I do think that, uh, like a lot of people are quote sniping, or they're they're not allowing people to fail. They're not, and and yeah. failure is a big part of the comedic process. I, I'm not a very funny person, but I try to be, and also I love comedy. I, I watch a lot of comedy, and 
And a failure is a big part of that process. And if you're not allowed to fail, if you're not allowed to bomb, if you're not allowed to like make jokes that might come across as bad or edgy at times, then you're not going to you're not going to be great. You're not going to have a refined uh, you know tight 5 10 minutes or an hour. And and then on the other hand, however, the outrage culture against the backlash against PC culture has also led uh, comedians to be yeah. more lazy because now you have uh, one of the greatest comedians of our generation, if not the greatest comedian of our generation, one of the greatest comedians of all time, basically doing cheap seat bits like, yeah, uh, trans people bad, ha ha. Like, and there were brilliant bits in that, uh, in his uh, even his newest special. But that stuff was so lazy, and that's what's going to uh, draw the crowd, and it's probably going to draw the wrong kind of crowd. There was one about the F word and the N word, where he was like, well, I'm not an N word. Uh, uh, why can't I use the F word? And and it was like, well, okay, what about a white person using the N word then? <laughs> like, yeah. okay, you say you're you're not an N word, and I understand what you're trying to say, but and and gay people are not the F word, right? I'm confusing you a little bit, but because I can't use hate speech, fortunately or unfortunately, yeah. depending on what your opinion is. <laughs> but you know, like it's it's literally the same as like a white person. Uh, it, it, being able to use the N word and using that as a defense is such a weak, like, it's just not good cultural criticism. And that's what comedy is at, at its heart. I was gonna play a bunch of uh, George Carlin clips, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. Do you have any other uh, opinions on this, like, really quickly before we go? I know this is an important topic, and I wish we could talk a little bit more about it, but. Yeah, and I think in some ways it's a more important topic than people usually give it credit for because I think that if you look at like sort of the culture war that we're in right now, and I think politics often has a culture war around it, like political correctness might be the most important like dividing issue. Um, as far as comedy, I agree with you that I think that the excesses of outrage online make it very difficult to be a comedian because to, to be funny, you have to, what makes a lot of jokes funny is that they kind of sort of balance very delicately on a line between um, you know the accept acceptable and the unacceptable and the perverse and the weird and um, you know it's it's hard to do that if you're worried that if if you if you fall the consequences will be really bad but at the same time yes I think that you know part of your job as a comic is to be is to listen to audiences and to understand and to learn from your mistakes. And I see a lot of comics not doing that. You know, I see Ricky Gervais doing the same transphobic jokes for, for, for year after year after year, or Dave Chappelle doing the same transphobic jokes year after year after year. And that to me seems like their failure as a comic, right? It's their failure to really listen to their own audience. It's their failure to really make jokes in a thoughtful way. So I think everyone can stand to improve. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, Natalie, thank you so much for coming. Uh, where can everyone find you? Can you just do a quick shout out on your channel? Yes, um, so my channel is called Contra Points, C-O-N-T-R-A Points. And on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, uh, uh, that's, that's where you can find me. Um, thank you so much for having me on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, again, thank you. I'm a huge fan and it's, all, it's always awesome to, to have people I admire on the show. Um, okay. On that note, guys, this is going to be the final episode of Agitprop for the summer trial period that we were doing. If you want to support the show, you can write to your membership advisors or you can uh, tweet it out to Jank. Just bother and harass them over and over again that you want the show to continue. And before we end this, look, I just want to say I'm glad that regardless of our disagreements, Jank does end up uh, platforming a lot of voices to the left of him. And that's something that you guys also need to to keep in mind uh, whenever whenever you want to claim that he's being like a centrist shill or something because of uh, because he got 20 million dollars or whatever. And look, before we go, I want to thank everyone. Like this obviously would have never been uh, put together in an incredible way that it was because I am completely just the worst person ever and 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 super disorganized. So I want to give a huge shout out to Carlos Godoy and Matt Arnold for the amazing artwork that you see on the show. I want to thank Bart. Skip, Craig, Edwin, Brandon, Jacory, Jesus, Adam, and Edwin again for making the show look, sound, and run well. Dan wrote Edwin twice. Uh, it's okay. Uh, these are the, I mean, none of this would happen without them, obviously. I want to thank Dan, who I just mentioned already, for uh, producing the show with me and putting up with me. 
Uh, I am uh, very hard to work with and he does a great job, but so is Dan. Dan's hard to work with too. I wanna thank Alex for editing. Uh, she also does the breakdowns and also the graphics. Uh, uh, for the graphics that you saw and like the awesome segments that we had. And look, finally, I wanna thank you guys, the TYT members who support this show. Because as I mentioned already, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't happen without you and it won't continue without you. And that goes for everything. Like that, that's not just Agiprop, it just goes for TYT in general. We're not gonna be getting that sweet, sweet British petroleum money anytime soon. And uh, you know, we say some controversial stuff from time to time. Advertisers aren't necessarily too fond of us uh, having a, a staunch anti-corporatist message. And the fact that TYT is willing and able to risk it and, and put a show like this out there whose explicit purpose is to agitate and, and uh, agitate you into taking action and, and uh, trying to educate you so that you can uh, better ask for, for autonomy in this uh, current political process. Like that comes with a price. And that price oftentimes is the corporate sponsors pulling out. So with that having said, you know, be sure to make uh, be sure to comment, tweet at uh, Jank, harass everyone on TYT if you want this show to continue. Uh, you know, your friends can podcast some episodes for free, share it. Uh, I'm Sam Piker, and I still don't have a catchphrase to sign off with, but maybe we'll find out one day. All right.